Hi everyone and welcome to this JavaScript tutorial to create the game Dots and Boxes. We'll be making it in an HTML file so that you can run it in any web browser. You may remember Dots and Boxes from your school days. Basically you make a square grid of dots and then each player takes a turn to connect two of those dots together. Uh, if you create a square, so if you create a box as such, you can write your initial in it and you get another turn. And you continue to play until all boxes are filled in and the person with the most boxes wins. So go ahead and download this template from the link in the description below. First of all, let's create the game board. So we'll need to set up a section here called game parameters. And we can create a constant called height, which can equal 550 pixels. We'll also need a width, but I'm thinking that we'll want to keep the proportion, like the ratio of the screen, consistent. So how about we create a section called Derived uh, Dimensions, and all of these dimensions will be based off the height. So create a constant called Width, and that will equal, say, height times 0.9. So it's going to be a bit skinnier than, than it is tall. Next, we need to set up the game canvas. So set up the game canvas. It'll just be a variable. So variable canv canv will equal, you can just use the document. We can create this canvas in code by going document, create element, create element, and then in quotes, just write canvas. We'll have to give the canvas some dimensions. So the canvas.height will equal the height of our board that we determined earlier. And the canvas.width will just equal the width. And because we've created it in code, we'll have to attach it to our HTML. So we can do that simply by going document.body append child, and then we can just pass the variable there. We'll also need a context. That's where we'll be doing all our drawing. So set up the context. We can grab that from our canvas. So var ctx context will equal canv.get context. And in there we'll want 2D in the quotes. And we'll also need a game loop of some kind. So set up the game loop. So you can use the inbuilt set interval uh, method. It requires a handler, so that's just basically a, a function name. We'll call that loop and a timeout. So that'll be in milliseconds. So 1,000 divided by our frame rate, which we'll set soon. So FPS, we can just put up here. Constant FPS equals 30. So that's frames per second. Head down and create our loop function. So function loop. And the first thing we'd like to do is to draw our board. So let's create a separate function. Draw board. Function draw board. So we'll need to set the color. We can do that through fill style. Color CTX fill style will equal, how about we create a constant here? Color board. We'll create that soon. And then we'll need to draw the rectangle. So fill rectangle, fill rect. The X will be zero, the Y will be zero, the width will be our board width, and the height will be our board height. Let's create this constant called color board. How about we create a separate section called colors? Constant color board will equal Corn silk. I'll choose corn silk. Let's give that a go. There we go. So I'm thinking the grid of our game will fit in down the bottom of this board. We'll leave the top space for the, uh, we'll leave a top margin for the score and the player name, etc. Now on the side, we'll want a margin on the left and right side as well as the bottom. It may as well be the same. How about it's equal to the cell size of the grid? So if it was a 5x5 five five grid, each of those cells would be also equal to the left and right and bottom margin. And probably we'll need a border too to make this stand out a little bit more. 
So head back into our code and let's create a constant called grid size. We'll set that to five, so a five by five grid. So this is equivalent to the number of uh, rows and columns. We'll need a cell size in pixels, so constant, we'll just call that cell. That'll be based off the width divided by, remember we said it's divided by the grid size, but we need the margin on either end. So that'll be the grid size plus two. So if it was five, that'll be seven. And we want a border as well, and we'll use lines later. So we'll also need a stroke width. We'll just call that stroke. And that will be equal to say the cell, one tenth of the cell, say, divide by 10. Head down, uh, where we set up our context, we'll want to set the line width. So context.line width will equal stroke. And we'll need a color for our border too. So how about we color border? We'll set that to wheat. A bit darker than corn silk. And we'll need to draw that now. So in our draw board method, we'll want to set the stroke style. So context stroke style will equal color border. And we'll need to draw a stroke rectangle. So context stroke rectangle. Similar sort of thing, x will be zero, y will equal zero. Now the width and height, we could just put the width and height, but the stroke is centered on that point. So we'll need to bring it in a little bit. So knowing that, we'll set this to stroke divide by two. It's exactly half actually, so this will be correct. Stroke divide by two. And the width will be the width minus our stroke. And the height will be Height will be height minus stroke as well. Let's give that a go. Uh, maybe a little bit thick. I'm just thinking for the game later on. So we'll change that to say cell divided by 12. Stroke equals cell divided by 12. Yep, that's looking good. But back into our code, we'll need to know the radius of the dots. So const dot, we'll just call that, will equal and just equal to stroke, say. So that'll be the dot radius. Uh, we may as well label these while we're here. Stroke width. And this one is the size of cells, as well as the left and right margin, as well as left and right margin. We'll also want, we might, while we're here, we may as well create the constant margin, which will be the top margin above the grid. And that will be equal to the height minus, now remember it's going to be the grid size, but there's going to be a bottom margin of one cell. So it'll be grid size plus one times the cell width. Top margin for score, names, etc. So while we're here, let's give the, the dots a color. So color dot will equal, say, sienna, a bit of a brownish color. Head down to our loop function. We'll need to create a new method here called draw grid. And let's create that now. Function draw grid. What will we do here? Well, we'll have to loop over our grid size, won't we? So for let i equals zero, i is less than grid size. Let's just take a look at our picture for the grid first. Can you see this is a two by two, this is a two by two grid, but you can see that there's three rows and three columns of dots. So it'll be the actual grid size plus one, i plus plus, for, uh, we'll have to loop over the columns now, let j equal zero, j is less than the grid size plus one, j plus plus. And then now we'll need to draw the dots. We'll probably, let's make a method for this, so we'll call that draw dot, and it will take an x and y coordinate. Now we'll have to base that on the, how about we create a method for that too, we'll say get grid x, and we'll pass the, the j, the, the column determines the x position, doesn't it? And we'll have get 
grid Y and the row determines the how far down it is. Let's create these now. So draw dot function draw dot. It'll take an X and a Y. Uh, we'll need to set the color first. So context fill style. We can set it to that new color that we had before. Color dot. Uh, we'll need to draw a circle. So begin path to draw a circle and the arc function. So it takes an X, which will be the X that we passed, a Y value. The radius is dot that we worked out earlier. The start angle is zero. The end angle will be 360 degrees or math pi times two. And the last is just an optional flag that we don't need. And we just need to fill that. So context fill. That'll be the dot. But now we need to work out these get grid X and so on. So just below function get grid X. So that will just return, we'll be passing a column, won't we? So return, it will be equal to the cell, so that's our cell size, multiplied by the column. But remembering we have a left margin equal to the cell size, so we'll have to add one there. That's looking good. And get grid Y, that's based on the row, the I. So that'll be equal to the top margin which we worked out, plus the cell times the number of rows, or the row number. That should be okay. Uh, let's test that out. Looking good. Uh, that's equal, the margin is equal to the grid cell size. Let's just try it with a few different dimensions. So say three. Yeah, and change that to say seven. Looking good, there's a space, there's always space at the top for our scores and so on. And just make it go to the extreme, let's try 17. Great, that's working well. Put that back to say five. I'm thinking when we move our mouse, we'd like to know which cell we're in. And when we move close to one of these two dots, it'll snap a line there. So it'll make it very user friendly. Probably the best way to handle this would be to create an object for each of these squares, each of these cells. So how about we create that object now? I'll just go down the bottom. So we'll create the square object constructor. So that's just a function. So function square will equal, sorry, function square will pass some parameters. So we'll Treat it just like a rectangle, so X, Y, that's the top left corner, and a width and a height. So this dot W will equal W, this dot height will equal height. Uh, usually we don't keep track of X and Y, it's not necessary. Usually we would keep track of left and right, top and bottom. So let's keep to that uh, convention. So this dot left will equal X, this dot right, will equal x plus the width. Now the top, this dot top will equal the y value, and this dot bottom, so this dot bot, will equal the y value plus the height. Now we need to know what square we're in when we're moving our mouse around. So how about we create a function? So this dot contains will equal a function it'll pass in a raw x and y value. And all we have to do is return whether or not that x value and y value are in those boundaries here. So return x is less than, probably less than or equal to, x is less than or equal to this dot left. No, sorry, x is le greater or equal to this dot left. And x is less than or equal to, this dot. I see a problem here actually. If we have less than or equal to, we're going to have conflicts between neighboring uh, neighboring squares. So how about we stick to the left hand side it being greater than or equal to, and the right hand side equal less than, just less than. So x is greater than or equal to this dot left, and x is less than this dot right, and y is greater than or equal to this dot top, 
and y is less than this dot bottom. That should be okay. Let's implement these somewhere. So how about just under we set up the context, we'll set up our game variables, game variables, var squares, which will be an array, and we'll also call, we'll say start a new game. Later I'm sure we'll be using this method again. So new game. Let's go down and create that. So just under get grid y function uh, new game. Uh, among other things, we'll be doing this start, sorry, set up the squares. So we'll need to initialize the squares array. Just make it equal to an empty array. We'll have to loop over. So for let i equals zero, i is less than the grid size, i plus plus. We'll have to initialize the row. So squares i will equal an empty array. For uh, let j equal zero, j is less than the grid size, j plus plus. This is where we'll create our individual squares. So squares i j, squares i j will equal a new square, new square, which takes an x value. We can use that uh, function that we wrote above, get grid x, which takes the column, which is j, uh, get grid y, which takes the row number, which is i, and the w, the width is just the cell width, the cell size, and the height is the same, the cell size. I'm thinking that each player should probably have a different color, so let's go up and set up some of these colors now. So we're going to have a color for the computer player, so the computer. Color comp will equal crimson. And we'll also have like a highlighted color for the computer. So that basically means when we move our mouse around the screen, before we actually uh, commit to selecting a side, it'll be in this lighter color. So we'll just call that lit. So color comp lit will equal, say, light pink. And we'll need something similar for the player's colors. So color player, color play will equal, say, royal blue. And the color player lit color, so the highlighting color, will be, say, light steel blue. We'll also need to keep track of whose turn it is. So just in our game variables, so game variables will have a variable called, say, player's turn. Player's turn. It's a boolean. So if player's turn equals true, it's the player's turn. If it equals false, it's the computer's turn. So we may as well set that up in our new game method. So just up here, player's turn will equal, we'll say it starts off randomly. It's a 50% chance of being the player's start or the computer starts. So player random time, if player random is greater than or equal to 0 0.5, well that's it, it's the player's turn, else it's the computer's turn. Okay, that's good. Let's head up and draw our squares. So we'll probably want to draw the grid on top of the squares, I think that'll probably look nicer. So draw squares, we'll create that function now, just after draw grid, function draw squares. Uh, we'll need to iterate over our squares 2D array. There's a convenient way to do that in JavaScript now. It's called uh, the for of uh, loop. So for let row of squares. So that'll iterate over every row of the squares. And then we can go for let square of row, so that'll iterate over every square of each of the rows, we will call the draw methods for each of those squares. So square dot, we'll make these soon, draw sides, so that's the currently selected sides, and we'll probably need to later draw the, draw the fill. So when they complete a square, we should draw something inside it. So draw fill. 
So let's go down and implement those methods inside our square object. So this dot draw fill will equal a function. We'll just leave ourselves a to do to do fill. And similarly, this dot draw sides will equal a function. And let's just focus on the highlighting to begin with. So the highlighting, the, the, the snap, the grid snap as such, snap to the closest side. Uh, so how about we create a property on square called this dot highlight. And what that will keep track of is the current, I guess, side that's highlighted. We'll work that out soon. So if that is not null, so if this dot highlight doesn't equal null, then we want to highlight something. How about we call another method, this dot draw side. So this dot draw side, which will pass whatever that highlight thing represents. And we'll probably need a color as well because the computer and the player are going to be separate colors, aren't they? So how about we create a helper function called get color, get color. And well, let's go do that now, get color. So just up before we have get grid X and so on, function get color, it will need who is, who do we need the color for? So that'll be the player or not. So that'll be a Boolean and whether or not it's light or dark. So how about we create a flag called light there. So if it's the player who needs the color, we'll return, but we need to know whether it's light or not, don't we? So return light. If it is light, we'll return color play lit, else we'll return color play, right? So similarly for the computer, so if it's not the player, it's going to be the computer. So we'll just go, if it's light, we'll return color comp light or color comp, which should be crimson. Yep. So that's getting our color. So back down to where we were drawing our side. So get color, whether or not it's the player. So the player, that's just whether it's the player's turn or not and whether it's light, because this is a highlighting, this is highlighting, we will want to set this to true. So let's implement that this dot uh, draw side, it'll equal a function and it will take a side, whatever that may be, and a color. Now I'm thinking we should, there's going to be four sides, so let's use a switch here. So switch side. So how are we going to represent each of these sides? Well, what if we just create an object, like a constant up the top? So let's do that. So what I mean, we'll be able to write side dot bottom. Well, we can do that now probably, and we can implement it soon. So yeah, let's go do that now. So up the top, just after our other, let's create some definitions. Definitions and we'll create a constant called side, which will just equal an object and we'll give it some index names basically. So bot will be zero, left will equal one, right will be two and top will be three. That'll save us having to type these integers every time and getting confused with ourselves. So back down the bottom, so if it's side bottom, we're going to draw a line, aren't we? We're going to draw a line on the bottom of the, so how about we create a method called draw line? It will take, well, let's go make that first. Draw line, so up where we're drawing our other things. Draw squares, draw grid, function, draw line. It'll take an initial point, so x, zero, y, zero, and a two point, x, one, Y1, draw a line, and we'll probably want to pass the color here too, I think. Color. So first things first, let's set that color. So context stroke, uh, stroke style will equal the color. We'll need to create a path, Con context begin path to start the line. We'll need to move to our initial point. So move to, 
that takes in x and y, so that'll be x0, y0, and we'll need to draw a line to the second point, so context line 2, context line 2, x1, y1, oops, and then we'll need to draw the stroke, stroke. That should work okay. So head back down to where we're trying to draw something. So we need an x1. So the x, the x, the initial point will be this dot left, won't it? This dot left, this dot bottom, this dot bottom. And the two point will be this dot right, this dot bottom. And we need a color in there, don't we? It's just the color that we've passed above. Okay, so we're going to do a similar thing for each of the sides. So side left, side right, side top. So for the side left, it'll be this dot left, this dot top, this dot left, this dot bottom. For the right, it'll be this dot right, this dot top, this dot right, this dot bottom, and for the top, it'll be this dot left, this dot top, this dot right, this dot top. Hopefully that'll work. We'll test all this after. But we'll need some way to uh, highlight, to set the highlighting. So let's create another method down the bottom called, say, this dot highlight side it'll equal a function. We'll need to pass the raw x, y coordinate from the mouse cursor or whatever. So the first thing we'll need to do is try to work out which is the closest side to that x, y location. So how about we calculate the distances to each side. We'll just call them, for example, d left and so on. So d bottom will equal the this dot bottom minus the y value. Do this for each of the four sides. So we'll have a d left and a d right and a d top. So the d top will be, it will be y minus this dot top, y minus this dot top. d left will equal x minus this dot left and d right will equal this dot right minus the x value. I think that looks okay. Next, we'll want to determine the closest one. So we can do that simply by using the math.min function. So determine closest value. So we can do that by going, we'll create another one. Let d closest equal math min, and just put all of those in there as arguments, d bottom, d left, d right, and d top, so that'll give us the minimum value. And then we want to highlight if, highlight the closest, if not already selected. If they've already selected a side, we don't need to highlight it, do we? We shouldn't be highlighting it if not already selected. So how are we going to keep track of whether something's selected or not? I think we'll need to put some more properties on this object. So how about we have this dot side bot, side bottom, side left, so on. We'll need to know whether it's selected or not. We'll probably also need to know whether who the owner is, who selected it, like whether it's the computer or the player. So we'll do that by creating a small object here. So owner will be null to begin with, nobody owns it and selected, whether it's selected or not, will be false. None of these will be selected or owned to begin with. So just copy that four times. We'll have side left, side right, and side top. Now we'll have to use those down here. So if d closest equals the bot one, the bottom one, and bottom isn't selected. So you can go this dot side bot dot selected. If that's not selected, so we'll throw in an exclamation mark there. 
then we want to highlight. We can set the highlight. So this dot highlight will equal side dot bottom. Right? So we're going to do a similar thing to each of the sides. So else if D closest, let's copy them in first. Right? So if D closest equals D left and the side left is not selected, then we'll set the side to left. We'll set the highlighting to left. If the closest is the D right, and this dot side right is not selected, then we'll set the side to right. And if the closest is the top, D top, and the side top is not selected, then we'll set that to top. I'm also thinking we should probably return return the highlighted side. Maybe the caller will need to know that. So return this dot highlight. Next thing that we'll need to do is to detect mouse movement over the canvas. So probably the best way to do that is through an event handler. So head up to the top, just after we set up our new game here. Let's create some event handlers, or one handler in this case. It'll be on the canvas, so canvas.addEventListener. Uh, the type of event we're looking for is something to do with the mouse. So it will be mouse move. And then what will it call when that mouse moves? So we can write a function name here. So highlight uh, grid, say. Highlight grid. So that'll call every time the mouse is moved. Highlight grid. Uh, the thing is the coordinate system of the mouse cursor is certainly not the same as the canvas. The mouse movement will probably be based on the screen coordinates, so we'll have to add some correction to, based on the canvas position. So we can do that. There's a, luckily there's a method for this. Variable canvas rectangle will equal canvas dot get bounding client rectangle. That's the one. So we'll use that to correct for the uh, canvas position. So let's go ahead and create this highlight grid method down below. Function highlight grid, it will take an event. We'll explicitly state what type of event that is. So at type and in curly braces, well, it's a mouse event, mouse event. We just need to close that, asterisk and that event. When it's the computer's turn, we shouldn't allow the player to highlight the screen. I mean, it would interrupt the flow of play. So we should only allow the, the player to, do, to use this. So how about we put an if not player's turn. So if it's the computer's turn, we'll return. We do not want to handle mouse movement. Otherwise, we need to get, uh, get mouse position relative to the canvas. So let x equal, it'll be this event dot client x minus the canvas rectangle dot left. And similarly for the y position, it'll be the event dot client y canvas rectangle minus the canvas rectangle top. And then we'll probably need to call another method here because the computer will also be needing to call this method. Highlight the squares side. So we'll just call this highlight side and it will take the x and y values. So let's uh, write that method now. Function highlight side takes an x and y coordinate. Uh, probably the first thing that we'll need to do is to clear any previous highlighting. So clear previous highlighting. Uh, we can just loop over the squares array and set the highlight to null. We can use a for of for that. So let row of squares for let square of row. And then all we have to do is go square 
dot highlight equal null. So that'll clear all the highlighting. Uh, next, we'll want to loop over the squares again and test whether uh, our mouse cursor is within it or not. I'm thinking we'll have to use a regular for loop here because we need to take into consideration the neighbors later. If I select the left side of this square, well, that will be equal to the right side of the neighboring square, won't it? We'll set up the uh, rows and columns first. So let rows equal squares dot length. Let cols equal squares zero dot length. For uh, let i equals zero, i is less than the number of rows, i plus plus. For let j equals zero, j is less than the number of columns, j plus plus. And then we need to test whether the cursor is inside uh, the square or not. So we've got a function for that called contains. So if squares i j contains the x y coordinate, if that's true, then we want to set the highlighting. So squares squares i j dot highlight side. I think we called it the same as this one just the x, y coordinate. Good. Remember that returns. We intentionally returned the side there. So let's just set that in case we need it. Let's side equals squares ij highlight side x, y. Also, once we've highlighted a side, we don't need to continue going through this loop, do we? We want to break at that point. If we hit break here, though, it will only break the inner loop. We want to break both loops. So to handle that, we can use something called a label. We can label the outer loop outer, and we can go break outer. So that should break to that loop. Uh, let's try that. Hopefully something will happen anyway. We haven't done this for a while, so. Reference squat. Okay, I've spelt square wrong somewhere on, pay, on line 104. Uh, oh, I see, drawing up here, S-Q-U-A-R-E. Let's try again. Reference square. Hang on, let's clear that. No, it's okay. Okay, then we have ourselves some highlighting, and it's working pretty well, I think. Cool. That's that done. I've just been having a play with this, and I've noticed that it doesn't always work, so I reload it. That's fine. I reload it. That's fine. Reload. If I keep reloading it, there, for example, it's not working. Now the reason is, is that we're sitting, we're setting a player, we're setting the player randomly at the beginning of the game. So, and we're using that player's turn as a condition on our highlighting grid. So that's the mouse event, the mouse movement. So how about we just get rid of this, um, we'll put a to do here. We'll get rid of that just so that we can test it fully. Give it one more turn. So now we can see the computer's color. Computer's color, yeah, so it's working every time now. That's good. We'll also need to detect clicks, won't we? So if we've got that highlighted and we click the mouse button, we expect a line to be drawn there. So head back into our code. Just copy the first few lines of our highlight grid function. Let's go up the top and create, set up a new event handler. So canvas add event listener. The event that we're looking for here is click and the name of the function that we'll call, we can just call it click. Okay, so just down here, let's create that function, just paste what we had in the clipboard there. And what will it do? So we'll rename this to click. Well, we basically want to keep this same uh, condition here. If it's not the player's turn return, we'll undo this, we'll uh, take away this comment soon. Uh, because if it's the computer's turn, we don't want to allow the player to click and interrupt the flow of the game, right? And just on the next line, we'll just call a function, say select side, which we'll create soon. So we'll need to keep track of what we've currently got highlighted, which cell we currently have highlighted. So how about up in our game variables up here, we create a variable called current cell. 
Actually, let's make it a plural, current cells, so it'll be an array, because we do have to handle neighbors as well. Uh, head down to our new game method. We'll initialize that current cells there, just make it an empty array. And where will we populate this? Well, just in the method above, highlight side. So in our highlight side, we're checking each, we're check each cell here, aren't we? So there we can go cell, current cells, sorry. We'll, just to make sure that it is empty, we'll just reinitialize it there. Current cells equals an empty array. And where we're getting the side back from the uh, highlight side method, let's check that to make sure that's not null. If side doesn't equal null, then we can populate our current cells. So we can just use the push command, push, and what will we be pushing? Well, we need to know the row and the column number, the cell number in effect. So let's just make a small object with row, and that will equal i, and col, which will equal j. So head down and create our select side function. Function select side. Now we'll have to check that our current cells array, make sure that it's not empty. So if current cells equals null, or current cells dot length uh, equals zero, it's empty, right? Well, we just want to return. There's nothing we can do here. Uh, otherwise, we want to select the side, or we'll make, it could be sides, select the sides. So we'll do that by iterating over the current cells using a for of. So for let cell of current cells. And we want to check our squares. Squares, now the row number will be cell.row and the column number will be cell.col. And we want to call a function that we'll create soon. It'll be have the same name, select side. So we'll select that squares side. And finally, we just want to make sure that the current cells is empty. After that, we no longer need it. So now let's go down and create this select side method in our square object. So just after there, this dot select side equals function. Now we'll need to check to see if uh, we have something highlighted. So if this highlight equals null, well, we have nothing to select. So we'll just return in that situation. Otherwise, we will select the highlighted side. So we can just do a switch statement for that. So switch this dot highlighted, highlight I should say. Uh, case, these are all sides, so side bot. Now remembering on our uh, on our object we have side bot, side left, side right, and so on, each with an owner and a selected. So we need to set the owner and set the selected to true for each of these situations. So side bottom, we can go this dot uh, side bot dot owner. It'll just be the current player, won't it? So player's turn. If it's the player's turn, it'll be the player. If not, it'll be the computer. And we'll also set the selected to true. Okay, and then break. We'll do the same sort of thing for each of the sides. Okay, so for side left, we'll need to change that to side left, side left, otherwise that's all good. Side right, change this to side right, side right, and then finally side top, change these ones to side top and side top. So we're just setting the owner and the selected. And after all of that, we no longer need the highlighting, so we can go this dot highlighted, this dot highlight equals null. We've already selected the side. Now we need to go up and highlight, sorry, we need to go up and draw these. So where we've got draw sides here, 
how about we write in here selected sides. So if uh, this dot side bottom, if this dot side bottom dot selected, if that's true, well we want to draw it. So we can just go similar, do a similar thing that we've done up above. This dot draw side side bot get color. Now the color is going to be the owner, so it'll be this dot side bot dot owner. And is it going to be, what's this, light? Is it going to be light? No, it's not going to be light. We'll put false there. We'll do a similar thing for each of the sides. So side left, uh, side left, so that'll be left here, and that'll be left here. This will be side right, side right, and side right. And the last one, side top, side top, and side top. So let's test that out. So I'm the computer. Oh yeah, it's working pretty well. Now, the only thing I was worried about is that if we approach this from a different direction, see there, we can still highlight it because it's only registered as belonging to this square and not this square. So we'll have to fix that up after. Uh, just as another test, how about we uh, inside our uh, select side method, we'll want, eventually we'll want to be switching between players, won't we? So switch players. Uh, we'll need to add some logic to here later, but just for the time being, let's keep it simple. Players turn equals not players turn. So the computer will have a go, then I will have a go, and so on. Let's test that out. So blue, red, blue, red, blue. But the only, as I said, the only issue is that we can come from a different angle and write over some of these things. See there? I can change that red to a blue, but we will fix that up. Go up in our highlight side function, highlight side, we're currently highlighting the current cell. So highlight current. Uh, this break, we're just doing that because there's no need to continue. So in between there, we want to determine the neighbor. So determine neighbor. And after we determine the neighbor, we want to highlight neighbor. Right, so how do we determine our neighbor? Well, first of all, let's create some variables. Let's create the row. Well, this will represent the row of our neighbor. It's currently at I. The column is currently J. That's our current cell. I'll just use commas here, not semicolons. Uh, we'll need to keep track of what the highlight is, what the highlighted side is for our neighbor, and whether or not we have a neighbor. So we'll initially set that to true. So if our current highlighted side, so up here, if the current highlighted side equals side left, and we have a neighbor, so and j is greater than zero, that means we'll definitely have a neighbor to the left, then we'll need to set the column will be equal to uh, j minus 1, right? Our position is j, so our left side neighbor will have a position j minus 1, and their highlight, from their perspective, will be the opposite of ours, will equal side right. Okay, so let's uh, just copy that a few times for each of our sides. So else that, else that, else, that, and we may as well put an else down the bottom. So, okay, so back up to this one here. So if the side is side right, and j is less than the number of columns minus one, cols minus one, then we definitely have a right side neighbor. Their column will be j plus one, and the perspective, sorry, their highlighting from their perspective will be left. Side top. If i is greater than zero, then the row of our neighbor will be i minus one. 
because it's above us. And the highlighting from their perspective will be side bottom. And finally, if we have highlighted the bottom of our cell, well, and I is less than the number of rows minus one, then the row number will be I plus one, won't it? It'll be below us. And highlighting from their perspective will be side top. Now, if none of that is true, then we don't have a neighbor. So neighbor equals false. Remember, we, we initialized it to be true. So if none of that is true, we don't have a neighbor. So to highlight the neighbor, if we have a neighbor first, if we have a neighbor, then we want to set the squares row, row column dot highlight will equal the highlight that we just calculated. And we'll also want to push to that current cells array. That's how we determine which cell we've clicked. Current cells push row, row, and column, column. Let's test that out. Right, so if we put one of these highlighted bottom and we cross over it, that's fine. If we highlight the top of our cell, cross over it, that's fine. If we highlight the right of our cell, that's fine. And if we highlight the left of our cell, that's fine too. So I think we've worked it out. Just make sure there's nothing going to happen here. Yeah, that's fine. It's working well. The next thing that we'd like to check for is whether a square is filled or not. If there's three sides to a square and we put on the fourth side, like that, well, that means we will claim that square and we'd get another turn. So let's handle that. So head down to our select side function. So currently we iterate over the current cells that have been highlighted and will be selected. So what we really need to know is whether or not those squares will be filled. So let's create a variable, let filled square equal false initially. If any of those ones are filled, then we need to set that to true. So how about we modify this select side function to return a boolean. So if all of that returns true, so if that's true, then we can set our filled square to equal true as well. Now what does that tell us? Well, it could tell us whether there's a winner or not. Uh, so check for winner. So if filled square, then let's put a to do in there, to do check winner. And also, if we even if you don't win, you should get another turn, shouldn't you? So we shouldn't switch players. So we'll put that in the else. Else will do all of this. Else will uh, switch players. It's not really switching players. Let's change that to be next players turn. But now we'll have to fix up this select side to return whether the square is filled or not. So down in our square object, how about we create a property called this.num selected to keep track of how many we currently have selected. We'll set that to zero to begin with. Now if a player fully selects a square, well, we'll need to set the owner. So we can go this.owner will equal null to begin with, just as we've got owners of the sides, we'll have an owner of the square. Head down to our select side function. So currently we select the highlighted side, so we've definitely selected something at that point. So we can safely increment the number of selected. So increase the number of selected. So this dot num selected plus plus. Now if that equals four, that means we filled a square, doesn't it? So if this dot num selected equals four, we can hard code that because there will always be four sides. If that equals four, then we'll set the owner. This dot owner will equal, well, whether or not it's the player's turn, right? So if it's the player's turn, it'll be the player, else it'll be the computer. We can also increment the score at this stage. So how about we put a to do here, to do score, and we can safely return true because this is a filled. So we can say filled return true. That is definitely filled at that stage. 
If that doesn't return, then we know it's not filled. Not filled. Return false. So let's test that out. So we should, when we fill a square, we should get another turn. So it's the blue player's turn. Yep, the blue player gets another turn. Now red, I'll put a couple here. So the blue player should get another turn. Yep, if I put that there, yep, another turn, great. Another turn. Now let's give the red an opportunity. So the red should get another turn here. Red, 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 blue. Great, that's working. Now let's add some fill to our uh, highlighted, sorry, our filled squares. So up where we're, here we go, to do fill. Now we don't want to fill a square if there is no owner. So if this dot owner equals null, then let's just return. We don't want to uh, highlight. We don't want to fill anything. So how about we give it a background? We'll give it a light background. So we'll need to set the fill style. Fill style will equal, we can just use our get color method for this. We require the player, which is just going to be the owner. So this dot owner. We require whether it's light or not. We do want it to be light, so true. And now we can draw the rectangle. So fill rectangle. We'll do this across a couple of lines. So fill rectangle requires an X value, which will be this dot left. I'm thinking we don't want to full fill the rectangle completely. How about we just fill it partially? So we'll say this dot left plus say our stroke width. The Y value will be this dot top plus the stroke. Uh, the width will be this dot width, but we have to take into account that we've come in a little bit. So it'll be minus the stroke times two. And the height will be similar. This dot height minus the stroke times two. Okay, that should be okay. And I'm thinking we should add some text. We'll put a to do here, to do text, for example, the name, the player, player slash computer or something, right? Let's test that out currently. So when we fill a square, now this should be blue. Nope. Did I read? Yes, I definitely did that, didn't I? Let me just check my code. I see I've capitalized top here. That's no good. We'll try that now. Let's give it a go. Blue, red, blue, red. Awesome. Red gets another turn. Blue, red, blue. Good. It's working. So I'm thinking we should add some text now. So head back into our code. How about we create a general get text function? So up where we're doing our, sorry, draw text function, I should say. So how about we, just underneath draw squares, we make a function called draw text. It will take a text as one of its uh, parameters and its position, X and Y, the color, and also the size. So we can set the context.fill style. That'll just equal the color. We can also set the font here. So context font will equal, now this is just a string. So we'll have to go size plus, that'll be the pixels. And then we can put our font type. So deja vu sans mono or any other font. And we'll need to draw the text or fill the text, I should say. So fill text which will take the text string and the X and the Y. So let's go up and create our text constants. So just under where we def uh, create colors here, let's create text. So constant text, well, we'll have text computer, well, which will just be that computer. And we'll have text, we'll probably need to shorten this because our cells aren't very big. So how about we have one called text comp small, which will be just the first four letters. And we'll do a similar thing for our player. So text play will equal player. And text play small 
will equal play. While we're here, let's set up the uh, text size. So text size, this will be the text size for the cell, because that'll be smaller than for, say, the, mar the scores up above. And we'll say that's equal to, say, the cell size divided by 3. Now head down to where we get our color, for example. So we, just how we've got get color here, let's create one called function get text. Function get text, it'll be a very similar sort of thing. We'll pass the player and we'll pass whether it's small or not. So if player, we wish to return, return, now if it's small, we'll return text play small, else we'll return text play, right? Now if it's not the player, we'll return, and if it's small, we'll return text comp small, else we'll return text comp text comp. So now we should be right to set up our text inside our square. So go down to where we're drawing. So here we go, this to do here. How about we write owner text here? And all we have to do is draw text. We'll do this over multiple lines because it's going to be fairly full, I imagine. Uh, it requires the text, so get text, which requires the player, which is this dot owner. It requires whether it's small or not. We do want it to be small, so that's true. The x location is this dot, we need to center it in our little square, don't we? So this dot left plus this dot width divided by 2. Uh, the height, the y, sorry, will be this dot uh, top plus this dot height divided by 2. That'll be in the center of the cell. The color, we can use our get color. Get color, which requires the player, which is this dot owner. And whether it's light or not, we don't want it to be light. So we want it to be dark to stand out. And finally, we need the size, which is our constant text uh, size cell. Let's give that a go. So fill a square, this should, this, sorry, this should be red, comp. I know what we need to do. We need to center, we need to center our text, don't we? So just right up the top where we set up our context, uh, set up the context. We can just set the context.text align. That just equals middle, or is it center? Center. And the context.text baseline will equal middle. Let's give that a go. So draw a filled square. There we go, looking good. And try a blue player. Blue, blue player. Yeah, it's fitting in well. Great. Now that we're doing text, we may as well draw our scores up the top here. So we'll probably have like a title player with their score and computer with their score. So let's create two variables up here. Uh, how about we go var score comp and score play. We'll set them to zero inside our new game. So score comp will equal zero, score play will equal zero. We'll also, when we select our side, see we've got check the winner. We can probably handle that logic now. So if score player plus score computer, if those two scores added together equal the total number of cells, so that's the grid size, isn't it? Grid size times the grid size, then we can handle well, let's do a to-do here. To-do, handle, game over. We also need to increment our scores somewhere, don't we? So that's where we, we do that down in our square, where we select the side. We've left ourselves a to-do here. So increment score. So if it's the player's turn, then we wish to imp increment the 
score for the player, don't we? Score player plus plus. Else, it's the computer's turn. We'll increment score comp plus plus, right? That should handle that. And finally, we just need to draw our scores. So let's go up into our, say, loop here. If we draw the grid, let's draw scores. Create that function. Just after draw line, draw squares, function, draw scores. I'm thinking when it's the player's turn, the computer's uh, score will be a different color. It'll be the lighter color. When it's not our turn, well, our color will fade out too. So how about we let cull computer will equal based on whether it's the player's turn or not. So if it's the player's turn, we want to use the color computer light. If it isn't the player's turn, we'll use the color computer. Similarly, for the player, so color player, if it's the player's turn, we will be using our normal color, color play. Otherwise, we'll be using our lighter color when it's the computer's turn. Now we need to draw the text, so draw <coughs> text. It requires the text, which will be based, well, it's going to be the full text, so text player. Uh, X location will be based on the width of the screen. How about we put it at one quarter, so times 0.25. The Y value, how it will be based on the margin, so we'll say margin times just 0.25 as well, say. The color will be the color that we decided above, color player. And the text size, well, we haven't made this yet, so text size, we've only got text size cell. How about we make one called text size top? Uh, let's create that now. Text size top. It'll be based on the margin. Uh, the margin, margin divided by say six, just taking a bit of a punt here. Go down um, to where we're drawing our scores. Do the same sort of thing for text computer. The width though will be at three quarters, so we'll change that to 0.75 and the color will be the color comp. Everything else should be the same. Let's give it a go. Player computer, that's looking okay. I see it's the computer's turn, so it's highlighted, sorry, it's in the darker shade than the player's turn. Yeah, that's looking good. Great. So in a similar way, we'll need to draw the scores underneath each one. So this will be the score of the player. The width will be at 0.25. The margin, we'll have to increase that a little bit. Color player, text size, we'll increase the size of the text as well. We'll multiply that by two. And copy that, do the same for the computer's score. So score computer, it'll be at 0.75 instead. The margin, the color will be the color computer. Text size, yep, let's give that a go. Uh, probably the scores could go down a little bit. Let's see if they increment first. Yep, so that's incrementing. Try the computer. Great. Uh, so we'll put the scores down a little bit. So say to 0 0.6. 0 0.6 of margin. Great, that's looking better. Let's just test the score a little bit. Awesome. Awesome. Yep, that seems to be working well. One more. Great. So now let's handle the uh, end game. So we'll go up and create some constants. We'll probably need to know the delay between when we finish and when a new game starts. So in our game parameters, constant, we'll call it delay end and just give it a number of seconds. So this is seconds until the game, uh, until a new game starts. Uh, while we're here, we'll probably reduce the grid size so we don't have to play so long to get to the end game. We'll just reduce it to two. We'll need to keep track of how many frames we have left. So in our variables down here, var time end, that will do. We'll set that up in our new game. So time end will equal zero. We'll need to up 
in our click and so on, where we detect uh, detect events, we'll probably need to, if the time end is greater than zero, then we don't want to be able to click, do we? So we'll get rid of this to do here. So this is this, it's not the player's turn, or uh, time end is greater than zero. That means we're currently in the, in, in the end game. This player's turn thing, we can't, we shouldn't be using this until our computer is automated. So we'll comment that out. Just leave a to do for us here and that or as well. So if the time end is greater than zero, we'll return. We'll need to do a similar thing in our other event listener, which is the highlight grid one. So just there, we'll paste that. So if time end greater than greater than zero return, don't allow movement, mouse movement during, uh, well don't detect mouse movement during the end game. Uh, we'll also need to go down to where we select our side, where we've got to do handle game over. We can handle that here. We can set time uh, end will equal math seal. It'll be the ceiling of the delay times the frame rate. So if we finish, we're going to set, set this delay in motion. So the delay is 2 times the frame rate is 30. So that 2 30s are 60. We'll have 60 frames before we end. So this is game over, isn't it? Game over. So where will we decrement this time end? Well, I'm thinking we can go all the way up to where we're drawing our scores. And we can test for it here because we'll have to uh, draw some special text anyway. So game over text. So if time end is greater than zero, that means we've entered at the game, the end game stage, we'll want to decrement our time end, time end minus minus. Now we could get a draw, couldn't we? We could get a tied score, so we'll have to check for that. So handle a tie. So if score comp equals score player, then we'll handle the draw. We'll draw some text to represent a tie. Uh, we'll need to set up some new constants up the top here. So we'll need to have a constant text for a tie or a draw. And we'll set that to be equal to say draw. And we'll need some text for a win as well. Win and we'll say We'll put a name before that, so it'll be like player wins. And the color for the tie as well. Uh, we could just set that to black, I think. Color tie black. Head back down to where we draw our scores. So draw text, text tie, text tie. The width will be at halfway across the screen, 0.5. The margin, we'll leave that at 0.6, say. The color will be the color of the tie. Color, tie. Text size, top. Um, we'll just leave that to the normal size text. The normal size text should be okay. Else, that's if it's not a draw, we'll have to determine who wins. So we'll say player wins. And that will equal if the score player is greater than the score computer. Otherwise the computer wins. We'll also need to determine the color based on if the player wins or not. Player wins. So if the player wins, the color will be the, color, the player's color. Else it will be the computer's color. And we'll also need to know the text. So whether it's computer or player. Let text equal, it's going to be based on the player wins as well. If it's the player that wins, it'll be text play, else it'll be text comp. So let's draw some text now. We'll want to draw the name first, so what we've just determined. So that'll be the text. The width at 0.5, the margin, we'll leave that the same. The color is just the color that we just determined now. Text size top, yep. And then we'll need to draw the wins underneath. So the text will be text, text win. Uh, the width the same, the margin, we'll, uh, we'll probably center it. How about we change that to 0 0.5 and this one to 0 0.7. Color, color, the color will be 
color, yeah, the color will be the same color. Text size top, okay, good. And finally, we need to handle when time end equals zero. So that'll be a new game. So new game, if time end equals zero, new game. So let's test that out. Okay, we have two by two. Let's try to get a draw or a win. Okay, this will be a draw. Let's see what happens. Draw. Oh, great. Yep. So there was a slight a two second delay. Let's do that again, but this time let the computer win. Computer wins. Great. And player wins. Player wins. Great. And it's resetting. I think that's working quite well. Just one more. Player wins. And that will do for this tutorial. It took a lot longer than I thought it would, so I'll have to create a second part. In the second part, uh, we'll automate the computer so that it can play by itself. But currently we have a fully playable two-player game, so you can still use it. I'll post the code from this tutorial down below, so feel free to download it and have a play. So until next time, talk to you then. Bye!